It is my uh, honor to introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, Major General Greg Martin. So let me uh, tell you a little bit about his uh, uh, biography, which is different from what we usually have in our ground rounds. Well, he's a graduate of West Point, 1979. And he also holds a master's in national security strategy from the Army Naval War Colleges. In addition to that, he holds two uh, master's degree from MIT, civil engineering and technology policy, and a PhD from MIT on both disciplines. He is retired from the US Army. He served on active duty 36 years on multiple overseas tours. Uh, he uh, led thousands of combat engineers in the first year of the Iraq war. In addition to that, he commanded Corps of Engineers in the Northwest Division. He was commandant of the Army Engineering School, also commanded Fort Leonard Wood, and he was Deputy Commanding General of the 3rd U.S. Army Central for the Middle East. He was also Commandant of the Army War College and President of the National Defense University. The reason why we invited Major General Martin to be our uh, speaker today is because he has, uh, in addition to his uh, numerous accomplishments as a leader with the U.S. Army, he has also experienced bipolar disorder for uh, early in life as an adolescent and then further on. Uh, now, as you can tell, he uh, performed uh, at a very high level. He was promoted to Major General in the U.S. Army. That is, uh, that is a, a, big year, a big deal. Uh, in spite or having bipolar disorder. Um, he will uh, talk to us today about his experience with bipolar disorder and the effects that it had on his professional and personal life. I actually was uh, uh, delighted to hear him speak at the International Society of Bipolar Disorders meeting. And I was, uh, I was extremely impressed, uh, not only by what he has accomplished, but uh, the way he has dealt with his condition. And um, there's, he, he published a book Bipolar, uh, bipolar Disorder, Bipolar General, My Forever War with Mental Illness. And uh, I have recommended his book to my patients. It, he, had, again, has led an exemplary career. So with <laughs> enough to say, I'm delighted, uh, Major General Dr. Martin, to have you here today. Thank you very much, Professor. And uh, thanks, everybody, for being on. It's really an honor to be with you all today. And thanks for that really kind introduction. So I'm Greg Martin, Major General, U.S. Army retired, and grateful bipolar survivor, thriver, and warrior. I'm fortunate to have achieved many big things in my life, West Point, Army Ranger School, master's degrees and a PhD from MIT, seven sub three hour marathons, including a 236, successful Army career, including leading 10,000 soldiers in combat during the assault to Baghdad, in a year of savage guerrilla and counter-terror warfare in Iraq, promotion to two-star general, happy 40-year marriage, and uh, most recently publication of my book, Bipolar General. That will at once shock and terrify readers while inspiring, educating, and saving lives. Much of this is because of, and only sometimes in spite of, living with a bipolar brain and on the bipolar spectrum. The advantage of living on the bipolar spectrum was that my brain produced and was flooded with excessive amounts of powerful chemicals such as dopamine, endorphins, and others. 
giving me an extra boost of energy, drive, enthusiasm, creativity, problem solving ability, positivity, and the like. These provided me with a physiological advantage for years. In short, my bipolar brain helped me until it went too high and then it nearly destroyed me. From Soldier, my career now is passionate mental health advocate. I've lived on the bipolar spectrum, I now know, since at least high school in the 1970s. My diagnosis is bipolar disorder type one with psychotic features. My story is one of successful service, then mental health crisis, followed by recovery and now new life. Bipolar disorder is real, like diabetes. It's not due to a lack of willpower or character, so nobody should blame the afflicted one. Bipolar disorder can strike anyone, young and old, rich and poor, educated and illiterate, janitors and CEOs, privates and generals, male and female, all races. The worst cases, if not treated, often lead to ruined marriages and families, ruined careers and finances, often homelessness, addiction, prison, violence, and suicide. This could easily have been my fate, and I envisioned and felt it coming on in my life. But if treated and managed because of professional medical experts like yourselves, one can live a healthy, happy, purposeful life, which is where I am now, thankfully. The knowledge you gain in this talk could save a life, maybe your own or someone you love. My life mission and purpose is now sharing my bipolar story to help stop the stigma, promote recovery, and save lives. I now understand that while growing up, I had a hyperthymic personality from my teenage years on. This was a, a state of near continuous mild mania. Living on that bipolar spectrum helped me for years with extra energy, drive, enthusiasm, and so forth but I was slowly re reaching, inching up the spectrum year after year towards actual bipolar disorder. Let me touch on my army journey. The reasons I joined were that I had a family tradition of military service and West Point was the best college education I could find. And I thought the army offered great opportunities for service, adventure, travel, great people, danger, important mission, fun, and more. Interestingly, I had exactly the kind of personality that the Army was looking for, you know, all that enthusiasm, drive, energy, and so forth. So I was a perfect fit. I was selected for all the key commands in military schools, civilian grad school at MIT, where my mission from the Army was to obtain one master's degree in engineering. And I came out with two masters and then a PhD shortly after as well as finishing the Army Command and Staff College by correspondence. This seemed normal at the time, but looking back, it was clearly evidence of a bipolar brain. I enjoyed my career, but along the way, two of our healthy, high-performing sons were diagnosed with bipolar disorder before me as teenagers, and no connection was seen with me, even as bipolar disorder upended their lives and our family, in our in life is still very challenging for both of them, but we had no foresight that I would be next. After I had been diagnosed, both the Veterans Administration and the Army Medical Department did independent investigations as to how did General Martin come down with bipolar disorder at, at his age. And they both determined independently that the onset of my bipolar disorder was in 2003 at age 47 during the Iraq War that my genetic predisposition for bipolar disorder was triggered by the intense stress, thrill, and euphoria of combat, leading thousands of soldiers in battle, along with the previous months of high stress preparation and training in Kuwait. I was a key commander in fierce combat, rapidly creating solutions to complex, unexpected problems under fire, often making life and death decisions. According to the doctors, this altered the wiring and chemistry of my brain. I shot into my first real mania when we attacked across the Kuwait-Iraq border and maintained that condition for nearly the entire year of combat. I felt bulletproof, like Superman, was overly energetic, 
euphoric, mostly enjoyed the experience, and by all accounts performed brilliantly. I did dip occasionally into short bouts of depression and had minor episodes of psychosis, specifically paranoid delusions that people were out to get me. But upon redeployment to Germany, the thrill of combat behind me and a, a lack of adrenaline, I fell into a 10 month long depression, which I sought help for multiple times, only to be told I was fine. But I wasn't fine. I was in the midst of my first full up down bipolar cycle. But again, bipolar mostly helped me until it didn't with the extra energy drive and so forth. From 2003 in Iraq till 2014, my bipolar disorder intensified as I was promoted from Colonel to one star general, then two star with eight different high intensity prestigious jobs and physical relocations. My bipolar disorder was unknown, undetected and undiagnosed for 12 years. And I felt great most of the time. So why was it unknown? Well, first, I felt wonderfully high most of the time because I was mostly manic and I was unaware of my condition. Even though I reported my depression three times, I was told that I was fine. The second point is that I was a high performer. I was a high ranking officer, you know, with great achievements and credentials, and that masked my bipolar disorder. So when the doctors looked at me and we talked and they evaluated me, all they could see was the exterior mask of success. They couldn't see past the mask that I had a very sick brain. Also, I was around thousands of people, but they were untrained. They didn't know what they were seeing because they didn't understand what the symptoms of mania and depression were. And then finally, I rotated to a new job every year or two before people could identify and pinpoint a problem. So over these 12 years, I entered cycles of higher highs and lower lows. But 2014 was the storm. I went into full-blown mania, a state of madness, insanity. I was disruptive, over the top, out of control, agitated, angry, full of rage, delusions, hallucinations, and extreme paranoia. I basically stopped sleeping at all for more than three months. At night, when my wife and son were sleeping and I couldn't, I sent dozens of emails and text messages bursting with, quote, great ideas. I CC'd hundreds of people, most of whom had nothing to do with my command. I went out on late night power walks, did physical training, lifted weights, took bicycle rides at high speed all around Washington, D.C., where I hallucinated that I, was, I could fly above the monuments. I had rapid forced speech in a continuous flow of new ideas. I once turned a 10 minute welcome speech to our foundation board into an all day out of control adventure, roaming the halls and campus of National Defense University, speaking ad hoc to anyone I could find, taking over lecture halls and classrooms, thus delaying a family trip to our son's special forces graduation by nine hours. And I had lost total track of the time. My grandiosity and religiosity went to extremes. I talked nonstop for hours on end. I stopped doing paperwork. Meetings went on for hours. I interrupted constantly, was late for everything, was often out of uniform. My risk-taking and lack of self-control were extreme. I was drinking between eight and 12 alcohol drinks per day after duty. I believed I could fly, that I was the smartest person in the world, that I held the key to world peace, and that I was the Apostle Paul in uniform sent on a mission from God to transform the Department of Defense into an established an institution that I had dreamed up in my own mind called the Global Security University, for which I nearly bought Washington DC real estate to house the campus. And that would have been with my own money. I saw the Holy Spirit descend numerous times, saw demons attacking our house. I repelled them with Bibles, crosses and holy water. I did about 30 significant religious events per week across four different churches. And now people began to notice. They were alarmed and they sent dozens of anonymous reports to my boss, who forced our general chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which then triggered assessments and investigations of my behavior, ultimately leading to my removal from command of National Defense University, which was the Department of Defense highest school. 
I got a call on a Friday afternoon, mid-July 2014, telling me to report to my boss on Monday at 10 a.m. in the Pentagon. In my sick brain, I wondered, will this be a promotion? I had worked for General Dempsey four different times, and we had a great relationship. I reported to him and saluted. He strode across his office and gave me a big hug. Greg, I love you like a brother. You've done an amazing job. Nobody could have done the job you did in just two years. I give you a grade of A+. Plus, but your time at NDU is over. You have until 5 p.m. today to resign or you're fired. And I'm ordering you to get a psychiatric evaluation this week at Walter Reed. Do you think I was disappointed? No, not at all. I enthusiastically declared, thank you, chairman, gave him a strong embrace and said, God put me in this job. He removed me. And now he's got bigger things for me to do. I resigned that day. I then underwent three separate psychiatric evaluations that month. Three times I was misdiagnosed as fit for duty, meaning no health problems, mental or otherwise. But I was totally manic and my doctors were just wrong. After being fired, I was forced to retire early and later was hospitalized. What goes up must come down. And over the next four months, I spiraled, then crashed into a complete breakdown, mind, body, and spirit, from mostly euphoric mania to anger, bitter rage, and paranoid delusions, then into hopeless, crippling depression and terrifying psychosis. In November of 2014, I did an emergency desperation walk-in back to Walter Reed and was finally diagnosed properly with bipolar disorder type 1 plus psychosis 12 years after onset in the Iraq war, which I since learned is about average, that that's about normal from onset to diagnosis. From 2014 to 2016, I went from bad to worse and lived in bipolar hell. At the end of my army career, then we moved to New Hampshire, where we owned a house. I was in a state of hopeless depression and could barely function for two years. I was experiencing terrifying psychosis nearly continuously. I, I believed I was being spied upon, arrested, that I was arrested, beaten savagely and murdered in prison, and that I died face down on a cold concrete floor, gurgling in a pool of my own blood. I wanted to die. I didn't want to live anymore. I saw and felt this powerful, invisible force grab me and throw me under a speeding 18-wheeler truck, ripping my arms and legs and head off and throwing the bloody stumps out to the side. Or it would steer me head on into an oncoming 18-wheeler. If that wasn't enough, every day a giant boa constrictor came and visited me as it slithered out of the woods, eyes blazing, tongue flickering, and crushed the life out of me, leaving me incapacitated for most of the day. When I wasn't on my back, staring into space, ruminating about every mistake I had ever made in my life, I would often dive on the hardwood floor, yelling, banging my head, punching myself in the head and face, yelling, angry at God. Thankfully, my wonderful wife, Maggie, and a devoted friend and battle buddy stuck with me, pers persevered, and got me into a great VA hospital. My inpatient care at the VA in White River Junction, Vermont, was excellent. I had top-notch multidisciplinary team treating me with medication, therapy, electroconvulsive ther therapy, and more. But it was still six more months of bipolar hell until lithium would save me. One point of interest uh, with the VA experience, um, when I went in to see the, the uh, psychiatrist at the VA, he asked the standard questions. Are you suicidal? I said, no. Do you want to hurt yourself or others? I said, no. But then he asked a question nobody has ever asked before. He said, do you have any morbid thoughts of death or dying? I said, yes, I do. And he said, okay, tell me about them. And I told him what I just explained to you all um, and, and told him that these, these thoughts were terrifying and I had them continuously. And he then said, okay, that's very serious. It's, those are called passive suicidal ideations. And the danger is they can morph into active ideations where then you do want to kill yourself and you, know, you do develop a plan and you end your own life. And that was really the critical basis where he admitted me into inpatient care. But I, I think that's something that really should probably be asked routinely at every, at every um, visit to the doctor. You know, do you have morbid thoughts of death or dying?
But finally, uh, months after my inpatient, my wife got tired of my lack of progress and my continued depression. And she called my doctor and said, hey, we got to try something stronger. And so we had a discussion and decided to try lithium. And lithium began my journey of recovery. And I call it a journey, journey because I'm in a forever war. There's no cure and no end. I must manage bipolar disorder like a chronic disease, which it is. I started lithium in August of 2016. And within a week, my depression and psychotic symptoms essentially vanished. Lithium constructed a ceiling against my mania. So when my brain wanted to go back into mania, it would bump into the ceiling and couldn't go any higher. And then it was a floor against depression. When my brain decided, okay, time to go into depression, it would hit the floor and it couldn't go any lower. And so that's that's sort of how I understand the effects of, of lithium and how it protects me against swings into mania and depression. We made a decision to move to Florida for the sunshine, brightness, and warmth. And I could feel the difference in my brain. It was a, It had a totally positive effect. But it took a team to lift me up. My wife, family, friends, medical professionals, they gave me the hope, the knowledge, and the perseverance that I could and would recover. And that was important because in bipolar hell, I did not believe that I would ever recover. I thought I was just going to be in absolute misery and then die. I had no hope. My strategy for recovery, which has been going on now for seven and a half years, is multidimensional. First are medications for balancing my brain chemistry. I will take them every day for life. These pills are my friends. I need them. Second is therapy with my therapist. And this is super important to help me deal with all kinds of different issues. And I also keep my wife, Maggie, pulled tight, wired in and engaged as a battle buddy for me with my therapist because she sees things much sooner than uh, than my doctors ever would. Third is healthful living, you know, healthy diet, plenty of sleep, lots of exercise, plenty of water, low stress, etc. And I would say those three elements of the strategy are necessary but not sufficient to have a recovery that's built to last. To have a recovery that's going to last, you, you really need to anchor those first three into what I call the five P's. And the first three P's I, I got from Dr. Thomas Insel in his book, but they are number one, first P is perseverance. You have to have the will to win, to never give up, to keep fighting because you will hit setbacks and you will have, um, you know, bad bouts of, um, uh, of uh, potential, potentially leading to a relapse. So you have to have perseverance. Second, you have to have a purpose in your life, your mission. And for me, mine is sharing my bipolar story to help stop the stigma, promote recovery, and save lives. And that purpose drives me. It energizes me. And that's what I focus my life on. Third is people. You know, surrounding oneself with a, with a group, a, a network of happy, fun, energetic people who lift you up. Uh, the next one is, and the last one is presence, which is the ability to get outside of your own head and think about your own thinking objectively. And that's really important because I think somebody, you know, with a, with a mental illness like, like myself, our own thinking can really lead us astray unless we're able to, you know, objectively think about what we're thinking and get back on the right track and not be led astray by misguided thoughts. Today, I would say my life is happy, healthy, purposeful. I'm thriving. My hyperthymic personality from back when I was younger is back, although it's less intense, which is a good thing. My bottom line is there is hope. Recovery is possible. I'm living proof. I now write, speak, and confer on bipolar disorder, and I love it. I'm, I'm a member of the International Society of Bipolar Disorders, as well as other professional groups. I've got a, a, a network of really phenomenal psychiatrists that I work with and I'm doing um, projects with and podcasts and speaking and panels. And it's just, it's wonderful. Um, this mission is, it serves others. It's larger than myself. It's energizing and I'm passionate about it. So some closing points. Um, 
we must elevate mental health to be equal to or more important than physical health. And when you think about it, you know, mental health really is a form of physical health because we're talking about a healthy brain and a brain is the brain is a physical organ. So it, it really is, you know, part of the same um, the same system as physical health. We also must lead the way in normalizing the conversation around mental health. And you all as leaders and uh, medical professionals can really help with that, as can everybody else. But I, I think having conversations like this one and, you know, the many speaking engagements I've had are will go a long way towards normalizing the conversation. There should also be no stigma at all. Uh, rather, battling mental illness should be seen as a heroic cause like women fighting breast cancer. And if you go back 50 years, breast cancer was uh, was considered um, shameful. It was embarrassing. There was a terrible stigma and people didn't talk about it until Betty Ford, the first lady in the 1970s, came out in the open and told the whole world about her breast cancer. And since then, over the last 50 years, it has evolved to the point now where women battling breast cancer are really held up on a pedestal. And, you know, National Football League players wear pink socks and pink shoes to, to really honor these women. So I think mental illness, those battling it should be, you know, really held in the same, in the same uh, light. Um, I want to throw out a, a call to action. And, and the call to action is that Everybody get gets smart on knowing what the basic symptoms of the most basic, uh, you know, the most common mental illnesses are, and then know what that knowing what they are, you know, check ourselves. So if everybody should really give do a self inventory and and really sort of see, hey, am I okay? Am I doing okay? Or do I have some of these symptoms? And if and if somebody does have these symptoms, if if any of you do, you know, go to a medical professional and get help because they can help you. And, and the profession is really great at treating mental, mental illness. And then if you have this knowledge, you can look at family members, friends, work colleagues. And if you notice um, some of these symptoms, you can have a friendly conversation and say, hey, look, uh, I really care about you. And I've noticed you're, de you're demonstrating some of these symptoms. Um, I think, you know, I'm concerned and I think uh, we should uh, go see a medical professional and I'll go with you. I'll go to the appointment with you, but I want to see, make sure you get checked out because I care. And I think that if everybody took that attitude and got that basic knowledge and was willing to be proactive and take action, I think we could go a long way towards preventing the worst ravages of mental illness and all the suicides that are taking place. Um, so anyway, uh, that's basically a synopsis of my story. Um, as the as the professor said earlier, it, it's in much greater detail and depth in in my book, um, and so I would invite you to continue your conversation with me. I've got a we a website called www.bipolargeneral.com, and it's there's tons and tons of information uh, on that website um, that you know thousands of people are visiting routinely. So with that, I'll go ahead and uh, uh, open it up for question and answer and comments. Thank you, uh, General Martin, for sharing your life story with, with us. You, you mentioned something uh, quite impacting. As you mentioned, uh, you were obviously very high performing, very successful. Uh, and as you mentioned, sometimes thanks to your condition and others in spite of. And I think as you mentioned, uh, what needs to be done is to manage the condition. And um, another key point that uh, you gave us is the, the importance of getting rid of stigma, the examples you gave us. So uh, I, I mentioned when I introduce you, I, I, I do give your book to my patients uh, as, a, as a way to, uh, an example of uh, ways to handle the condition. As you mentioned, you follow your medication treatment, your psychotherapy, and uh, just general rules of well being. So uh, thank you. Thank you, General Martin. Uh, let's open for questions now. Uh, uh, virtually or physically, raise your hand. If 
Any comments or questions? Dr. Crawford, please. Hi there, thanks for, for joining us. Um, I am a, a clinical psychologist in the department and I'm lucky to work with a great team of reproductive psychiatrists in our perinatal mental health clinic. And so we often co-manage bipolar in situations where folks are either finding the for the first time the things that work best for them after a postpartum psychosis, for example, or wanting to make careful adjustments to the things that have worked in the past so that they might get pregnant again. And one of the things I love about doing that work is the really close co-management of those cases with psychiatrists, which as a psychologist providing the psychotherapy side of things, we don't often have that opportunity to work so closely with our psychiatry colleagues. And I wonder, General, what your advice would be from your perspective on how psychologists or therapists in general might best, and psychiatrists might best work together in co-managing those cases. Well, thanks, thanks for the question. Um, I would say that the psychiatrist and the psychologist should really be collaborating and communicating very, very closely so that they both really understand the situation, you know, with the patient so that they're sharing information. There should probably be, uh, you know, it, on, it, it, on some level of frequency, uh, a combined meeting with the, the psychologist, the psychiatrist and the patient, because it, it, they, the only way you can really get all three in complete harmony is if they do actually talk to each other from time to time. And then, of course, sharing of information. So, you know, uh, you know, I would totally expect the psychologist to be sharing the highlights of any meeting, any session with the psychiatrist, expressing any kind of concerns and, and vice versa, so that you really have a triad, a team of three that is that is fully aware of and in sync with the patient and in providing the best possible um, care um, in concert. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yes, thank you for that answer, Dr. Martin. What you describe is what we call collaborative care. We have a clinic here at UNM of uh, early psychosis, and we have also patients with recent onset mania bipolar disorder, and uh, it's done the way you just described. Awesome. Other questions or comments, folks? Yes, um, uh, Dr. Delmer, please. Thank you. Uh, General Martin, thank you for your moving presentation and your very courageous self-disclosure. I... I what I wonder is I appreciate your sharing of your keys, your own personal keys to six ongoing kind of management and success of your management. Um, can you give any advice to a hypothetical patient or person who is struggling with finding those keys for themselves uh, as to how to, help them to increase the chances and reliability that they will understand that it's meaningful for them to take medications to, to find the right medications to um, pursue support, including psychotherapy and some of those other factors that you mentioned, in addition to advocacy, which is again, really wonderful that you're doing. So can you, can you point out uh, or repeat any factors that helped you to get to where you are today? Uh, yes. Um, you know, when I got diagnosed in November of 2014, I was extremely sick with um, severe depression and psychosis. And I knew there was something really wrong with me, but I didn't know what. I mean, I didn't know I had bipolar disorder. I, I didn't know what it was other than my life was in shambles and I was barely functioning. And so when I got the diagnosis, I was actually extremely grateful. I, you know, I acknowledged it. I accepted it and said, OK, now I at least have a label. I have a face and I can begin to, you know, do battle with the enemy. And um, and so I was grateful for it. Now, that didn't mean that I that I, I, I did um, all the right things uh, because I was just in such bad shape and I had, you know, really no hope. 
and I never thought I would get better. But once I did sort of hit bottom and started to climb up, um, I then said, okay, you know, I owe it to um, my wife, my family, um, you know, the world, you know, God, myself, to do the best I can to get better and recover and start living a normal, healthy, happy life again. And so I, I was, you know, I, I was very serious about working with the, the medical professionals and the inpatient um, uh, treatment was really, really good. I, I, I actually loved it because I had, there were seven people on an interdisciplinary team and they were all focused on me and helping me to get better. And, you know, sort of from a selfish perspective, I said, wow, this is great. I've got these seven really top notch professionals who are all they all really care about me getting better. So I should want to get better, too. And so I worked at it, you know, really hard. And I, I stayed close to this team of, um, of professionals. And and then I just said, you know, I, I started reading about the disease and started learning more and more about it and how important the medications were to get my brain chemistry in proper balance about all the different things I needed to do. And I just said, okay, I am, I'm going to do this. And, you know, because if I don't, I'm going to backslide and probably fall back into a relapse and who knows what bad things can happen, you know, in a relapse. And, you know, I don't want to have my life destroyed and, you know, end up dead. Um, you know, and so I, I started very rigorously applying, you know, my sort of disciplined mindset towards being a good patient and recovering. And, you know, slowly but surely, I sort of crawled back up out of the pit, you know, out of bipolar hell. And that was um, over seven years ago. And um, I'm, I'm just absolutely committed now to, um, you know, living this purposeful life and making a difference in terms of mental health advocacy. So I, I think to sort of summarize, I would tell the person, look, you know, you, you've, you've made huge strides already. The fact that you have a diagnosis puts you head and shoulders above most people who have a mental illness. You're diagnosed. That means we know what the problem is, and then we can have come up with a solution. And so now, you know, you, the, 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 the hardest part is, is really done. Uh, when you have the diagnosis and you have a, a, a treatment uh, methodology, and then it's just really grit and determination in not giving up and just moving forward, you know, one day at a time, one step forward, keep going, don't give up, keep taking your meds, keep working out every day, keep eating healthy, get plenty of sleep, and just little by little, your life's going to get better. Dr. Romero, go ahead. Oh, Dr. Tone, I don't know if you know me. Not a doctor yet, but thank you. One day. <laughs> um, I think something that you touched on, um, Dr. Martin, of your care team wanted you to get better, and you thought that that was something that you wanted to. And I, I think that underscores a lot of the work um, that I hope to do is helping people realize that they deserve to, to feel better and that like caring for themselves is, is really important. They should like like themselves and they should feel good about themselves. Um, and I'm saying should, but I mean, self-care and self-esteem and self-efficacy are so important in, in perseverance. Like those are the foundations of perseverance. And I'm, and I'm, I'm really glad that, um, that you, that you care about yourself. I think that's so important. And, um, and I think your your words have been very inspiring today. So thank you. You're, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Um, you know, what you just said is so important because when I was in bipolar hell, just in severe depression, I, I mean, I was a mess. I, I didn't shave. I didn't get a haircut. I didn't wash my clothes. I didn't take a shower. I mean, I just didn't care. And I didn't like myself. And I think the turning point was when I went into inpatient care. It was a it was a bright, clean, new facility. Um, the the staff was 
terrific. I mean, the nurses were great, the therapists, the doctors. Uh, they had a chaplain who was part of the team, and she was the best chaplain I've ever been around. And so she really worked on kind of the spiritual, emotional aspect of um, of um, recovery. And, and she just really boosted, you know, my spirits because of how positive she was and how caring. And so I think I think what you just said is exactly right. Other questions or, or comments, folks? And Gerald Martin, there's some in the chat, there's some very uh, unique statements from our faculty and, and learners about your talk. Okay. Um, May but, I ask you know, General Martin a question? Please do, Dr. Vicente. Yeah, thank you. Um, General Martin, I have a question for you regarding, um, I'm a neuropsychiatrist over at the VA. And from time to time, we have the opportunity to care for patients um, who are active duty. And one of the issues that frequently comes up is a concern for many of them raised regarding how they may be disclosing any sort of mental health issues might potentially lead to problems in regards to their military service. And I was wondering, as part of your advocacy for um, patients with mental illness, if you've had an opportunity to speak with um, active duty um, service members who may be struggling with how to reach out and get this help uh, and how they sort of try to, maybe how you help them to deal with maybe some of the stigma of mental health within like uh, the US military and how it might impact their careers. Um, yes. Uh Certainly, there is um, strong stigma in the military. I don't know if it's any worse than in the civilian world, but it definitely exists. You know, and one of the things is that, you know, in the military, part of the culture is to be tough, be strong. And so it's, it's sort of perceived by people that, oh, if I have a mental illness, that's showing weakness. And so I can't, I can't reveal that. I can't show it. Um, and, 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 you know, really, that's, that's very unfortunate. Um, because we know that if if left uncared for, these mental illnesses can absolutely destroy a person's life, career, family, et cetera, and can lead to death, incarceration, death, and so forth. So it's it's a terrible thing that people feel stigmatized and they don't want to get help. And like you said, a lot of people will say, well, I don't want to get anything regarding my mental health or mental illness or brain condition. I don't want it in my records because I'm afraid it'll cause me to be separated from the military or it'll cause me to lose my clearance or other things. I would say that there was a time then that was, was probably true, you know, maybe 20, 30 years ago. Um, you know, back when I was came in the in the army i mean nobody talked about mental health it, it just wasn't even discussed it was nowhere on this uh, on the um, agenda and you know care was very distant you had to go to a big regional hospital in order to get mental health care but i, I would say that since the 9 11 wars you know uh, back in 2001 i think that the frequency of deployments with so many troops going back into combat over and over again that the military has has really learned a lot about mental health and about brain conditions. And they're much more accepting, understanding and tolerant of people with mental health situations. And so for, for example, um, if you go back to pre 9-11, people with PTSD who needed to be treated were separated from the military. Today, there are thousands and thousands of people with PTSD that are in uniform serving. Same thing with people who had de have depression, who are taking medication. Back pre 9-11, people would be separated in, in a military re medical review board. Now, thousands are allowed to continue to serve. Most recently, um, people with um, uh, bipolar disorder type two are being continued in service. They're not being separated. The two that are still and I just got this. I spoke to a, a large Navy command this week, earlier in the week. And uh, the, the doctor, the psychiatrist at the Naval Hospital said that when that every type of mental condition that comes before them essentially is handled in a case by case situation. Most of them are not 
disciplined. They're not separated. They're not forced out of the service at all. The, the only two big exceptions to that are bipolar disorder type one and schizophrenia, which typically will lead to a medical review board and then a separation. Um, so I would say to the person that, you know, let's say the worst thing comes true and you do lose your military career, but if it ends up saving your life, that's a pretty good trade-off. Thank you. I really appreciate that. It's very You're helpful. Thank you. Yes, thank you, General Martin. In fact, talking about uh, stigma, uh, your work no doubt has contributed to uh, help with stigma even within the armed forces. So thank you, General Martin. Another comment here, Ms. Romero, she disclosed that she also uh, has bipolar disorder and she was also thankful for your candid and helpful conversations. Thank you, General Martin. You're welcome. Uh, other thoughts or uh, uh, questions, folks? Hi, good morning, sir. Uh, my name is Captain McDaniel. I'm the Chief of Behavioral Health for the New Mexico Army National Guard. Hi. Can you hear? Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. So um, one of our psychiatrists is in your graduating class right now that you're doing this uh, speaking for, and he invited me on. And I just uh, wanted to say, first of all, um, thank you for speaking so openly uh, about the, your, your condition and, and the fallout. And as, a, as the behavioral health provider, we you know, very much fall in line with what you were just discussing, right? So the PTSD, the depression, the anxiety, and even uh, suicidality, we work really, really hard with the soldiers to get them rehabbed and back to fit to fight standards so that they don't lose their career. And we do have very few, you know, we've had a couple of, uh, of the schizo, um, phrenia related disorders that we've had to discharge people for schizophreniform, schizoaffective, uh, and bipolar one, but we, you know, we do work really hard if they're stable with the bipolar two and on their medications and we're not having the chronic suicidality with them, we do everything we can uh, to keep them in service if that's what they wanna do. Uh, and so it has changed a lot from when I originally joined in the early 80s or late 80s, early 90s, um, when people with PTSD were just being put out left and right for their PTSD related behaviors. Um, and now I have people serving in the guard that have as much as 100% service connected disability for uh, different mental health or physical conditions and they're allowed to continue to serve. Yeah, that, that's terrific. I re really appreciate um, those insights. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thanks for sharing that, Ms. McDaniel. Other comments or questions, folks? General Martin, thank you for your very unique presentation, for sharing your life with us. Uh, I am sure that uh, your presentation is going to make us better doctors, better psychiatrists, better providers to treat our patients. We're very grateful. Thank you, General Martin. You're most welcome. It was a huge honor. And uh, sir, thank you for inviting me. I, th this was awesome. And thank you, everybody in the audience. <laughs>